Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Kilian Wegman from Munich, Germany. Professor Wegman is a specialist shoulder and elbow surgeon at the OCM Clinic in Munich, Germany. He's a well-known expert in upper limb surgery with main focus on shoulder and elbow. Professor Wegman is an active researcher in the field of shoulder and elbow pathologies. He's listed with over 120 publications and has taken part in numerous congresses and meetings. He's associate editor of the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow, as well as editor and chief of the German journal, Ober Extremitat. Since 2020, he's the second vice president of the German Society of Shoulder and Elbow, the DVSC. Moreover, he's an active member of ISACOS, ESCO, and Air Trauma. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Professor Kilian Wegman from Munich, Germany. Over to Kilian. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a thousand for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to to be able to talk in this beautiful format. I'm very happy to to share my thoughts on distal humerus fractures with you all. Um, as you've just heard, I'm working in Munich now at the OCM clinic. Um, uh, but uh, several years before that, uh, I've been working in the Cologne University, um, where I had my trauma teaching and um, did my certification. And that's why I want to greet my former colleagues and my former boss, Lars Müller, who uh, have definitely to be mentioned as co-author, co-authors for this talk, because uh, many of these concepts and many of these clinical cases we have shared and, and done together. Um, there is a conflict of interest because all uh, of these companies, um, the implants will be shown in my talk. Uh, I'm member of design teams of these companies and, and therefore uh, this conflict has to be mentioned. With the introduction, I want to, sh to, to offer you that I teach you what I know about distal humerus fractures, which surely is not everything. So please excuse me if um, I share my thoughts and maybe it's not everything <laughs> correct or I don't know everything. Um, what is it that I can tell you that I've learned from the literature? It's, it's surely a lot, but it's not everything. Again, we all know that our studies are not perfect. We have limited case numbers. Um, we have limited um, evidence, and that's what makes um, surgery difficult, but also very interesting. Um, I want to encourage you to get training, to exercise surgery, um, to get teaching, and also to teach, because in my eyes, uh, when you teach, uh, the one that learns the most is yourself. And there are numerous um, surgical courses available that do excellent training uh, so that we don't have to train on our patients. The distal humerus fracture is mm, a not rare and it's a complex pathology. Why is it complex? It is that we have a complex anatomy on the elbow. This is something that I think is very beautiful on the elbow, that it is really, really complex because it um, entails three um, joints which um, are uh, put up together in a articulatio compositae as it's called in latin so it's a, a composite joint and in this image um, you can see how ex in, ex let's say exact the congruences of the joint and this uh, being the distal humerus shows us how precise we have to be uh, when we perform surgery on dislocated fractures um, because we have to reconstruct or replace the anatomy as good as possible. And actually, going back to this slide, when we look at an x-ray, it doesn't look that complex. I think here it looks even more complex than on the x-ray. How can a trauma uh, be generated or how does trauma on the elbow look like? This uh, sadly is not a distal humerus fracture, but it is a, a ultra slow motion video that has been done on the University of Cologne, as you can see here, of a terrible triad injury. And as we can see here, dramatic impact and changes are done onto the joint when a significant trauma hits the elbow. This 100% is also true for distal humerus fractures. And therefore, we must not only look on the things that we see in the x-ray, but also uh, assume ligamentous injuries, maybe nerve injuries, muscle tears. This is true for any trauma that we treat. 
Now, when we look at the most common classification on distal humerus fractures, which is given to us from the AO, I think we can separate this slide in two segments. So this upper segment that is marked out right now uh, are the fractures that we can treat with fixation, with reconstruction. And when we look uh, onto, onto this uh, lower segment, I think in these fractures, at least in some patients, it is becoming debatable if we can fix them. In those, nobody will discuss that we can fix them. There's no, no prosthesis needed. However, in those, it is debatable. You can fix also these or those, the C3 ones. This is the topic of the talk. Can we fix or replace? However, those, that's where it is debatable. And those are a special entity in my eyes because the shear fractures in the frontal plane, they pose very specific challenges on us. So it's not, it doesn't come by accident that uh, a smart surgeon like Doubly and, and the group of Graham King have brought up a specific fracture classification for these coronal shear fractures, which I think uh, is pretty handy because it emphasizes for us how complex these fractures can be. And the problem of a coronal shear fracture is that it will influence your plate position because your screws will have to come in more in this AP or PA direction. And if there's comminution present, your fragments will be very slim, so you don't have lots of bone behind the cartilage. And that's something that definitely or probably we all will agree that is very difficult to treat if you have small or slim bone behind cartilage. It's always very difficult to fix it. And not only to fix it, but also to get it healed and keep it vital. And the patients who, as I said, there's a specific group of patients where it is even more debatable to replace the distal humerus instead of fixing it. It's the elderly patient. And um, we should not put all patients above 65 or 70 years into one age group because nowadays there are people with uh, 70 or 75 years who are active tennis players or golfers or hikers or swimmers or even surfers. So I d I'm not a fan of putting people into groups according to their age, but in studies, however, somehow you have to do it. We did it in this study. Uh, we checked on 30 patients about uh, above um, of 70 years of age. And in those, uh, fracture fixation of the distal humerus was done. And it worked out quite well with pretty good uh, results. Because I think that is it's common knowledge, that the elderly patients, they have weak bone for sure. And um, that's a problem. But also they have, um, they do not feel problems of their elbow that much. So if you have a loss of range of motion of 20 degrees, maybe a young patient who is working uh, will have a very unsatisfying result, whereas a 75 or 80 year old patient has a good result. So we should not exclude reconstruction of the distal humerus, even in the group of the elderly. Here's a case example from this study where um, we had a good result. Now, if you want to fix a fracture, either in an elderly or in a young patient, you should have, or it is good to have, a solid surgical technique. And I want to present to you now a concept of this humerus fracture fixation, how I am, have gotten used to it. Um, definitely, it's not the perfect technique, but I think it's a good, a good concept for a lot of fractures. The x-rays here are from a uh, simulated fracture in a cadaver specimen. Um, you can see that we have a multifragmentary comminution of the joint block distally. This is um, a video and I would usually start with a dorsal incision for these C-type fractures because then I have all options to go around the condyles I can use an olecranon osteotomy, I can use an, a tricep sparing or olecranon sparing approach. So the dorsal uh, approach to the distal humerus is a universal approach. I think it's very common to do this incision for distal humerus fracture fixation. 
And now in this specimen, the lateral side has been dissected first. You see here the triceps tendon skin has been retracted. This is the olecranon. Here you see the distal humerus here with the fossa, which is involved in the fracture. And here you see something very common in distal humerus fractures, especially with weakening bone. But you also see this in, in strong, let's say, 50-year-old males. They have comminution on the lateral side. And why is that so? Um, from CT studies, we know that the bone quality on the lateral side is less dense than on the medial side. And we could think about why, what is the reason, why is the lateral side a bit less dense? Um, I think there are several uh, reasons. One of them maybe is, um, this is something that how I look at it, uh, however, when you take your arm in front of you, and this is uh, the area where we do most of the motions with our arm, we grab, um, we take a bottle of water, for example, uh, or anything that we do, we have a virus loading uh, on the elbow because the pressure is going down on the arm, so we have compression on the medial side. That's, that could be one reason that we have more mechanical loading on the medial side of the elbow. It's multifactorial uh, for sure, but I think we have to keep in mind that the bone density is weaker on the lateral side and also osteoporosis starts early on the lateral side than on the medial side. This is something that we know from basic studies. So here we can see after the fracture, you have a puzzle. It is a um, fragmented bone, there's some bone missing, some bone has turned into liquid because it was compressed so hard and was never hard before. So how do you want to fix this? This is very difficult. So that's why I don't start on the lateral side. But when I look onto the medial side, this is now the medial side of the specimen. You can see here the crista, so the, 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 the crest of the medial column is very strong. It's very dense bone. And you do not have a lot of fragmentation in this fracture. And this is something that you can do when you plan your approach or you plan your fixation. Um, at hand of a CT scan, you will often see that the, the medial side here is much stronger and the bone is much more dense. And uh, that's make, that makes it a lot, of, a lot easier to get a good reposition. You can see, you can put these fragments together and this is a true anatomical, you barely see the, fractures, the fracture gap. And then what do you do? You do temporary fixation, for example, with the K wires. And then in this case now, with the olecranon being taken away because of the multifragmentary situation on the joint line, um, you now have a solid base on the medial side where you can start your fixation or reposition. And this is something that comes in very handy. In these multifragmentary fractures, it's impossible to put, first of all, the joint together and then fix it to the shaft. You will fail miserably after hours because it's difficult to puzzle them together without a solid fixation point. And by first of all fixing the medial column, I think it's handy because from then on you can start puzzling your fragments together. This now is a cadaver bone which has been frozen and thawed for several times. So the bone quality really is extremely bad and this is very soft. However, this is a concept that I also use in living patients. And then you can fix everything together starting from your solid fixation point on the medial side. And this will also help you to get the rotation of the capitulum fragment correctly very easily. If you start on the lateral side, I challenge you that it's very difficult to get the rotation of the lateral fragment towards the shaft because if you try to get an anatomic reposition, you will never find it because there is a bone loss often here. We will see this soon in a live case. So this is a 69-year-old male. He had a second degree open fracture and this is very typical. You see this medial spike. And this is the go-to place for me when I do repositioning of the slumal fractures. That's where I start. He had, first of all, had a fixation, an external fixator put on because of this open uh, fracture character. Then he was sent to us and here you can see that there is some comminution going on in the joint line. So it's not that easy. It's not very simple. And now when we start here, this is the lateral side, radial side. You can already see here, this is the joint. We will fix this without osteotomy. 
But what you can also already see up here, there is um, a gap, there is bone loss, comminution. Now switching over to the medial side, this is ulnar nerve, so medial side, you see this solid medial spike, where we will be then easily able to get a first fixation. And you can see here very nicely, it's easy to get an anatomic reduction, push the fragments together, put on a clamp, bring in a cave wire, and you have half of the joint is, let's say, already fixed. It's a starting point. This is the X-ray, final X-ray of this patient without osteotomy, and I think for this fracture, it's a good result. So, as a remark, when we have fractures, we should not always think in one way, we should think in several ways. And we lo should look at the fracture and ask ourselves, cannot the fracture help us in fixing it? This is a case of a technique that we call transfracture approach, um, where you use the fragment, you uh, flap the fragment away, and by that you get immediate access to the distal humerus. So if we have distal humerus fractures, we do not always need an osteotomy. We can help us, us by using the fracture itself. Another case example, 65-year-old male, second degree open, had an ulnar nerve problem, also was initially treated with a fixator somewhere else. And we can see that he has a metaphysical fragmentation, but also some a severe uh, a joint um, <clears throat> comminution. And he also got treated nicely with double plates. He We used an electrical non-osteotomy in him. And also, again, we started medial. As you can see here, you have a large, solid medial fragment that was easily put up here, and the comminution was happening radially. And he had a favorable outcome after a year. So maybe I've shown you cases that worked out well. Uh, however, we all know that the dyslumous fracture can be pretty complicated. We have ulnar nerve problems, according to this review, from 0 to 51%, average 13%. That's a high number of a nerve complication. We have got mechanical failures up to 30%, especially in case of poor bone quality. And that's why in these cases, we we've gotten over the years into thinking about elbow prosthesis or everybody got in there in, into thinking that and then stiffness 60 percent that's not surprising but that's massive that's something we have to tell our patients and non-union of 10 percent it's also very high 10 percent is a lot so poor bone quality is a negative risk predictor and mckee did a beautiful story a study in 2009 and since then Nothing comparable has come out, actually. Did a multi-center prospective uh, RCT, where he compared fixation versus total elbow for distal humerus fractures. And he summarized that the total actually was better, and this is uh, for elderly for sure, because he had faster surgery, less revisions, but it was small number, so it was 12 versus 12. If you ask a statistician, 12 versus 12 doesn't tell us a lot but is up there the best study that we have on the topic. And um, ORIF versus TOTAL, uh, Mansat's review, multi-center study, sorry, uh, of up to 90 patients, which is it's terrific numbers. And they looked um, into the results and they also found that they, have, uh, they had huge complications, uh, uh, up to 30%, 23 percent of revisions in several studies. So all these uh, numbers, they show us that this is a very complicated surgery and we have to make a good plan before we do it. And total elbow is an option, but it's not the savior because it also is a very complicated uh, procedure. So what is the reoperation risk after total elbow arthroplasty versus osteosynthesis? This is from 2020, it's a new study. 140 totals versus 500 fixations with a five-year follow-up. So it's a beautiful made study. And we have to see that the total elbow um, patients, they were older and were uh, more sick, let's say. They were sicker, sicker patients, which is not surprising because nobody would want to do totals in a young patient. 
The reoperation risk was lower for the total than for osteosynthesis within the entire cohort. And however, the death rate in the total group was after 3.6 years was 65%. This is, so when we talk to these patients, we have to be aware that many of them won't live long. So this is something that should guide our decision. And this is one of the important uh, messages I want to give you. If you have an elderly patient with a fracture that you think needs to be fixed or treated, that needs to be treated, total is a good option according to the study because it's, let's say, safer for the short term. But these patients, they won't have a long term. Most of them, most of them won't have. And another message from this study, in patients older than 65 with intra-articular dyslumous fractures, ORIF had better outcomes than TEA. So that's the opposite. That's what I meant in the beginning with the literature. We won't get the entire knowledge or we won't solve any question when looking into the literature because there will be some things that will, uh, um, will not convince us because it's the opposite, that the studies are not um, speaking with one voice. So complex fractures of the distal humerus in the elderly again, primary or total or internal fixation. And they found no differences in the functional outcomes between total and fixation. They had um, a reoperation rate in the TEA group of 63% in about five years or six years. That's massive. And they, the authors of the Spanish group, they said that recent trend towards the use of total elbow instead of osteosynthesis in the elderly should be re-examined. So we all should be all be aware on the high complication rates of these procedures. And again, a study, this is the most recent one, I think that I found, they compared complications, reoperations and clinical outcomes between RIF and total for distal humerus fraction in the elderly. They said the TA produces a more reliable range of motion, which also is my experience. In the total, I have much less stiffness uh, than in the fixation. Um, also, reoperation and elbow stiffness logically were lower, and um, functional scores were similar. However, some good uh, arguments to make to have it uh, in use for elderly because elderly patients want to get back quickly or have to get back quickly into their normal routine. Otherwise, we all know they quickly lose their independency and they end up, let's say, in a caring or a nursing home. So this is something also I think about when I have an elderly patient with such a fracture. I want to have him back home doing his normal routine for to stay, to be able to stay in his daily routine. Um, now, the total, one more uh, uh, show in this direction, in this uh, systematic review, 10 journal papers and 270 patients were included, and most of them were treated with a Coonrad Moray for acute distal humerus fractures. And uh, these elderly patients had an overall complication rate of 21%. So, again, this is a very, very serious surgery. It's not harmless. It is not the perfect solution um, which we can throw in any patient. I think it is reserved for elderly patients who most likely in the amount of the remaining lifetime they have will not run into the significant complications of the total elbow, which is uh, infection and uh, reimplantation. This is a case uh, of a 76 year old female. She had a fall C3 fracture, a low C3 fracture. There was a total implanted. You see here the fractures were taken out, the humerus was cut. These fragments, well, it would be difficult to fix them in such a patient. Nice closure, total elbow is in. So this was a good procedure in herself. She had a good outcome. And this was a fast and easy way for her to get back into her daily routine. But we all know images like this in patients after total elbow prosthesis emplacement. This is a patient who had her prosthesis for a fracture when she was only 45, as I recall. 
and then there was a reimplantation, removal, reimplantation, removal for aseptic loosening, and then at some point, maybe she was 65, then there was an infection, take it out, rinse, debride, put it back in, reinfection. This is a, this is a never ending story for the patients. We then finally decided that there is no reward for putting in another total elbow. And this is her, she's an avid uh, uh, piano player. And using this instrument, she was able to go back to the piano without having an elbow joint. But without these instruments, you know, the elbow is biomechanically not usable. So therefore, uh, it is very, very difficult <clears throat> to treat these infections on the elbow. So why do I tell you all this? It's not that I want to uh, uh, dramatize the total elbow prosthesis, but I want you that we all decide very clearly on what we do with the patient with these fractures. And if there is an alternative to the total, we should use it. And the hemi is a nice advantage, is a nice alternative, because we have a mere humor replacement and no ulnar component, which reduces uh, the complication risk at least a little bit. Um, it is also possible to convert it to uh, a total later on. However, there you won't find any reports on the outcomes of a converted total elbow in the literature yet. What are the disadvantages? We do not have an ulnar component and we may have wear of the olecranon or the ulna against the hemiprosthesis. Um, but at the moment there are no reports that these are clinically significant. We need to have a, a stable elbow or we need to be able to reconstruct a stable elbow to put in a hemi. Therefore, we need repairable, intact or reconstructable medial lateral collateral ligaments. We need to have um, the radial head, the coronoid, uh, co intact or at least reconstructable. And this is how uh, the end of a hemi pros uh, prosthesis looks. It's, it's, it's very time consuming to reconstruct the ligaments stable uh, to the uh, epicondyles, um, otherwise the prosthesis won't work, and the epicondyles are very, very important to have. So a hemi implantation goes quickly in the beginning, but in the end when you want to fix the ligaments, it's, it's getting very complicated and time consuming. And that's why we have contraindications for an hemi. If the coronal is defect, if the radial head is gone, if we have insufficient support of the epicondyles, or if the ulna is abnormally shaped. So this is not too good because we do not have epicondyles in this case. I don't think that it's working too well on the medium to long term. What are the results on the complications of the hemi? The results overall are presented to be rather reliable and good, and complication rates to be at least a bit lower than in the total. Fatness has done a nice uh, uh, paper on this. They said that the results are comparable to the ORF, the maps between 70 and 90 uh, is, is, is acceptable. And um, however, we only have short-term studies, so we do not know too much on the long-term outcomes of uh, the HEMI. The case example of, the 50, of a 58-year-old uh, female, she had a complex distal humerus fracture in my hands. I couldn't fix it. It was too complex. And she also had an involvement of the lateral column. So we reconstructed the lateral column with a plate the insertion point of the ligaments reconstructed with screws because you need to have bone where you put on the ligaments. Otherwise, the ligaments won't heal onto air or onto the prosthesis. And she had a very good outcome two years after surgery and she was very happy and she was very young, 58. So rarely we have unreconstructable fractures in, in young patients like 58 year olds. And in those, in those, I think the hemi is a very good option. Here in Smith's study, he has shown young patients under 55 treated with distal humerus hemiparthroplasty and they presented a subject, um, very satisfactory clinical results. This is a 65 year old male. What would you do here? Osteosynthesis or a hemi? Well, if we don't know enough from the x-ray, we take a CT. Now when we look at the CT, we see many, many small fragments you see here. The center of the trochlea is, is gone, but there is a fragment. So what do we do if we do not, we have more slides. This looks very complex. And if we take a 3D, 
It really is complex, but he's a very, very young patient, 65. He's a very active guy. He has a big garden and wants to cut trees with his chainsaw. And he was very, very um, eager to, re to keep his bone. That's why he came to us. And we consulted him that we will undertake a fixation. Uh, we try to fix it, but uh, we had the hemi ready if it would not be possible. And this is a video from the surgery. If when you look here, we got uh, some nice reposition, puzzling the fragments together. But then, as you can see, everything falls apart. And this, for me, is the only tip I can give you. If you have these uh, many fragments that just puzzle <laughs> away from each other, I don't think it's it's fixable. It won't work. Uh, otherwise, I don't think that there are black and white decision makers on how to fix or not to fix. I think it is your decision. It has to be in, in your experience if you're able to do it. However, in him, I wasn't able to do a fixation. We put in a hemi, we got in a nice alignment, nice cementation. Here again, I put bone into the lateral column to give the lateral ligament and extensor muscles a bed to heal. Sadly, this one was a bit prominent. He couldn't feel it, however. Uh, during the follow-up, it started migrating a little bit, and I was very worried that uh, instability would result. However, then it stayed there after six months, and after 18 months, he was very happy with the result. And as we do not put in uh, ulnar component in these hemis, there is no necessity to, or the weight bearing can be done a bit more freely uh, than uh, with a total, because as you might know, uh, a total elbow prosthesis is limited to five kilograms of uh, weight bearing in a single event. If you do a repetitive motion, like moving stuff from left to right when you're at work or so, it's at actually one kilogram. And this also includes that the patients usually should not like put their weight on their arm when they get out of bed or something. So this is something that is very important when you want to put in a total elbow that you tell this to the patients. In the hemi, it's not that strict because the humor component doesn't loosen that easily as the ulnar component, because the ulnar component doesn't have that much of bony support, as we all know. That's why the aseptic loosening is significantly more often happening in the ulna. And um, now I want to close my, uh, my, my talk with a summary. I think that unreconstructable fractures in the young patients are not common. And in young patients, I don't mean a certain age, I mean patients with a good biology, who have an active uh, way of living, and who have a relevant time uh, uh, ahead of them that we think they will live through. And in those patients, we should try to prevent a replacement in fracture surgery. And the general principle should be that we have to preserve bone stock as long as we can, especially on the elbow where we have so little bone stock compared to other joints. And if we have to replace, we should evaluate if we can use a hemi, because the hemi has clear theoretical advantages over the total. We have many black spots in the long-term outcome of the hemi. However, the medium-term outcomes are uh, favorable. All the studies, also on HEMI, but everything in elbow surgery has uh, some small numbers, so we do not have the full truth yet. So I want to close and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kilian, for this very comprehensive presentation. Uh, Kilian, you can stop sharing actually. Yes. Uh, thank you, Kilian, for this very comprehensive presentation on distal humerus uh, fix versus replace. A uh, few questions, Kilian. Uh, Kilian, uh, I looked at some of the papers and especially you've shown the one by Erika Colleen from uh, this part of the world, Asia, and they looked at what are the factors that affect the total elbow. For example, does the uh, uh, triceps uh, approach, uh, triceps on, triceps off, uh, tricep reflecting, do they approach, uh, I mean, do they affect the outcome? Um, so in regards of the total elbow or fracture per se, total elbow, it does total for elbow. sure, because the triceps is uh, the very important extensor mechanism of the elbow. It's also an important stabilizer. And when I was 
initially taught doing total elbows. We did um, triceps. Um, we took down the triceps from the olecranon, uh, like in the Krent approach, where you um, dissect the triceps away from the olecranon. It gives you a beautiful overview, but the triceps is weakened, and you have to fix it back onto the olecranon, and this will weaken the triceps, and it is a clear source for complications. So uh, we have then uh, switched several years ago to use the lateral olecranon, lateral paraolecranon approach from Graham King, which I think is a, it is perfect for also, you can use it for complex fractures if you want to dislocate the joint, but for the total elbow, it's excellent. And this uh, completely preserves the triceps. So you go medially and laterally of the, of the triceps and then you dislocate the joint. This is um, something that is very helpful and I think um, definitely the approach influences the outcome of the total elbow. Thank you, Gillian. And what about the kind of processes, linked versus unlinked? There's again a lot of debate on the mechanical stability. So what is your preference? I am coming from a center where we usually have linked uh, all the prostheses. Um, because I don't, you know how it is in surgery, once you have bad experiences, you won't go back to it. So I think linking an implant uh, gives you, especially in elderly patients, it is, I, in young patients, I rarely do a total or almost never. Uh, in those, if I have to replace, as I said, I do a hemi, I fix the ligaments and thereby I have a stable joint. And in the elderly patients, I often are not sure if they have the biological capacity to get the ligaments healed back together. And that's why I tend to do a total and in those then, and especially in fractures, if I do a total for fracture in the elderly, I link it because then I trust the linkage mechanism of the prosthesis more than the biological healing. But if you have a case where you get the impression that the ligaments will heal and you will get a stable implant, you can do an unlinked prosthesis like in the um, in the tournier uh, replacement, where you can also replace the head. If you have a prosthesis that does not replace the head, I wouldn't do it unlinked actually, because the joint is not stable. Thank you, Killian. And uh, Killian, the, in this elderly age group of patients, you have their skin is often very fragile, right? Very, very thin skin, and they have a potential to have a very, I mean, a grade one fracture, grade one open fracture. It's very common to have a distal humerus fracture that is open. And in that circumstance, would you prefer, I mean, if it's commuted, would you prefer to retain the entire humerus or you re replace it? Um, if it is uh, an open fracture in the elderly, I would still make my decision depending on um, the fracture pattern. Um, so if it's a grade one or grade two, I would either do a total or a, a fixation depending on the fracture mechanism. I wouldn't be... But it is, this is a very subjective um, announcement, so it's only my experience. Uh, I wouldn't have an increased, let's say, fear of an infection only because it was open. So if that answers your question. Thank you, Kilian. Yes, it answers, definitely. Uh, thank you, Kilian. Uh, we are also joined by Loy. Loy Al-Khatib is an orthopedic surgeon based in Dubai. Uh, Loy, your questions to Kilian, please. Yeah, hi, good evening, guys. Thanks, thanks, uh, Professor Wegman, for the nice presentation. Actually, I would like to take the chance uh, and send a thank you message to my uh, senior mentor, Dr. Dabberly, who was my uh, mentor during my fellowship uh, in Canada, Winnipeg. One of the questions for you, Prof. Wegman, regarding the bone loss. The distal, if you've managed to secure the medial and lateral column and still the bone loss in the middle, how do you how do you approach this bonus? Would you ignore it and proceed with the fixation, or yeah, or or just um, move to the land B, which is a replacement? So um, what do you think about that? So in the center we have the fossa, and then we have the trochlea, right? And if I if I have bone loss in the fossa. I don't mind because the fossa has been shown not to be of biomechanical relevance. If I have bone loss in the trochlea, this is a severe problem. If, if it's not fixable, um, I can recall a case in a younger patient where we put in then a bone graft 
uh, where did we take it from? Uh, maybe the iliac crest. We put in a chip in the middle because if you make the trochlea too narrow, uh, it's not going to work because the olecranon is, is, is not going to be fitting anymore. The congruency is going is going to be lost. Um, but um, this was a rare case. I think mo in most patients you won't have that problem. You will often have the problem in the fossa. That I don't mind. They can be a, a big hole, I, like in outer bridge Cassivage procedure, where you produce a hole in the humerus. And there's a biomechanical study that has shown that if you use, if you produce this big hole in outer bridge Cassivage, it doesn't influence stability. So I wouldn't mind too much in flexor fixation for the fossa. The trochlea has to have some contact that it doesn't collapse. Uh, the same goes for the capitulum, exactly. Um, the other one, the, in patients with, they are smoker, diabetic, and you do an olecron and osteotomy, and there's a big chance of non-union in these guys. Would you, how, what's the best way to fix the osteotomy? Would you go, still go for the, uh, the KYs or the tension band, or, or would you ch choose a plate for the better compression, or would you use a single intramedullar screw? Do you, what yeah. do you think about that? Yeah, so I am, I'm not, I'm very biased because I have, I'm an elbow surgeon for like all of my career, and I think I've done quite some cases, but I've never done an, an circular fixation of the olecranon. I've never been taught, I couldn't do it. I've taken many out, but I've never put one in. So I've always been told, taught to, to use plates. And uh, we have used these double plates uh, from mid Artis, which are very low profile. And they have many, many, many advantages. However, they're very costly. They're expensive compared to a uh, circlage. So, um, but I have to admit, I have never done one. Um, and I really like the advantage of these low profile plates because if everything is fine, you don't need to remove them. And you don't have, you don't force your patient into, an, into a second surgery. Um, if you have a circlage, often you have to take it out because the wires are sticking out, they are migrating, they feel it under the skin, and the double plates are, are, are hidden below the um, anchorneas and the uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, and you can't feel them, they're gone. So I think this is a beautiful solution. And how I do it when I do a fracture fixation, I have the patient uh, positioned. I put the plates on the olecranon, I drill one screw up, one down, and then I take them off, and then I do the osteotomy. Because in the end of the surgery, it's easy Down to put the holes. on, yeah. because you are all tired after this humerus fixation, and then you only have to throw the plates on. I have done the intramedullary screw um, several times. I, what I didn't like and why I stopped using it, the, the screw is straight, but the olecranon is not. And this can give you some sharing, and this will might lead to a, a, sh a shift in your f uh, reposition of the olecranon. So there also I would recommend to bring in the screw first, take it out, and then do the osteotomy that will reduce the sharing. But ma mainly awesome. I do these these double plates. So what's your yeah? So what's your cutoff to do the osteotomy? Would you do it in every case, or just in cases of the community intraarticular fracture? What do you what do you think about that? Uh, I've I have been consulted otherwise, but still I do it the way that I try to, to fix it without the osteotomy, and then if I feel that I fail, <laughs> after <laughs> I, I, I try to be patient because I want to prevent it. Um, but in the complex cases like a real C3, I think it's very very uh, okay to do the osteotomy right away. In the C1 um, or C2, you can try to do it without. And there are tricks to, to go around the epicondyles and do some minor dislocation movements that you can prevent an osteotomy. But osteotomy rarely is the biggest problem. Mostly the biggest problem in these fractures is the fracture itself. The fracture if you want itself, to go for that's... time, if you want to go for, for yeah. saving time, do the osteotomy. Your last question is about uh, heterotopic calcification, the HO prophylaxis. When do you give the patient an HO prophylaxis? Do you think there's uh, there's a place to give them a routine HO prophylaxis for the first six weeks or no need? I know the routine scenario is no need for the HO prophylaxis. What's your st strategy for that? Um, all, all patients get ibuprofen or anything of non-steroidals. 
Um, we don't use indomethacin as a fixed regimen, only if the patient has had a history of HO before that or in revision cases. So if I have an HO case that I revise, I give indomethacin. Otherwise, I don't do any specific HO prophylaxis. And aside from these very risky patients who like have a cerebral trauma and lie on the intensive unit, I haven't seen a, a surprisingly high rate of HO in distally humerus fractures. Most of the problems is in my eyes would be managing the ulnar nerve, having a bony healing, so not getting a pseudarthrosis. These are the two most topics that I see as problems if I do revisions uh, or what I have to do with most of the thinking myself. Uh, nice. One of the audience asking about ulnar nerve transposition. Uh, you do it routinely for these guys? In fixations, I don't. I try to preserve the anatomy. Um, I try to hide the plate under soft tissues and put the, the, the nerve not onto plates, but onto soft tissues. And I check if the nerve is stable in the end of the surgery throughout the whole range of motion. If I flex and then always subluxes ventrally, this is something where I consider fixation, uh, a transposition, sorry. Um, and in the total elbow arthroplasty, because it changes the natural anatomy so much, I, I have been taught always to transpose it. Transpose. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, thank you. I think that's it. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Wegman. That's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this very comprehensive presentation. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people. Thank you so much for joining in. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Goodbye. Goodbye. All right.